everybody. Welcome to A Case of the Jills. So this video today is kind of like part two in the series where we're gonna continue to talk about this new topic that I'm super excited about, which is allostatic load. We talked in the video earlier in the week about how this relates to hypothalamic amenorrhea. And because this concept is applicable also to overtraining syndrome, I'm going to cover that today. I don't wanna repeat a lot of the stuff that you heard if you watched the first video this week, but I do wanna mention a few points that are really important in case you are just tuning in for the first time. So first we need to talk about overtraining syndrome and what it actually is. It's very interesting because normally when I talk about overtraining syndrome, see, I did it again, I never use the word syndrome. So sometimes people think that when I use the word overtraining that I'm just using that term sort of colloquially or that I'm not actually referring to overtraining syndrome, otherwise known as OTS, but I am, in fact, I am referring to that. So let's remember that overtraining syndrome is the end result of a situation where there has been an outsized amount of training with not enough recovery to compensate. One of the biggest problems we have with overtraining syndrome seems to be that people still somehow equate it to something that can only happen to elite level athletes. Or just because it seems that the most high profile cases we've heard of overtraining syndrome have been in men, typically people do not associate it with something that happens to women. If you think about what we know about overtraining syndrome in uh, the world of ultra running recently, or, or sort of recently, we know a lot about Jeff Rose, we know a lot about Tim Olson, and you know, there's debate about whether or not Anton Krupichka actually was overtrained or kind of what was going on there. The only female that we have any word about is Anna Frost who, by the way, just competed in hard rock, so I'm gonna guess she's recovered. I can tell you by personal experience that you don't need to be an elite level runner to blow your brains out. In fact, I actually had someone uh, question me once and say, you know, that is something that happens to Olympic level athletes who train upwards of 15 hours per week. And then it kind of puts me in this awkward position where I actually have to justify my stupidity to gain some kind of legitimacy. It's very weird, but we'll get into that in a little bit. A lot of times when people find that they're sort of heading down the rabbit hole of overtraining syndrome, they ask the question like, why did this happen? How did this happen? And so this concept of allostatic load helps us understand sort of maybe the whys it did happen. Um, if we're smart enough, it helps us take a look at where we are right now in our training and of course nutrition and lifestyle so that we can possibly prevent it from happening in the future. And if we're already down the path into full-on overtraining syndrome, we can use this model to understand the different facets of the problem and see how we can combat them in order to get healthy again. So allostatic load is actually the cumulative wear and tear on the body as it is subject to chronic stress. And as you heard me say in the video at the beginning of the week, each time the body senses stress, a small little adjustment is made on a physiological level somewhere in the body. Over time, those small adjustments can become dysregulation of an entire system, or in the case of overtraining syndrome, systems. So in that way, we can say that allostatic load is the sum total of the adaptation to stress. Let's remember here, stress is not always bad, but when it becomes chronic, as with training or work, school, a million other factors, that's when we have difficulty. And as I talked about again in the first video this week, everyone has a different threshold for all of these factors that do equate to stress. So all of the factors that we're gonna talk about, whether they are physical or psychological or involving really anything, it doesn't matter how perhaps someone else experiences those things, what really matters is how you are experiencing those things. Comparison here is futile, not only between yourself and other people, but also between yourself at this exact moment in your life and maybe a few years ago. And it might be different a few years from now. Allostatic load is talking about this moment in time. It's a snapshot of everything you're going through. I did a ton of research to understand how this model can work with overtraining syndrome. And of course I looked into a lot of, you know, how do we diagnose overtraining syndrome? Or of course, how do we measure certain parameters so that we can lead to a definitive diagnosis of overtraining syndrome? And the one thing that's true is that there's really no answer for a lot of those things. However, in one of the studies, which I will link below, uh, it was uh, Henrik Gustafsson in 2007. He did talk about how the biological markers for overtraining syndrome all seem to yield conflicting results. So we actually have to look at subjective factors in order to understand whether or not this is where we're headed. We can't really take any kind of test to understand if we're perhaps more susceptible to overtraining syndrome. And the reason why is because it is multifactorial and there are so many factors, some of which are objective, some of which are subjective, 
And what's important is that we kind of take stock of our own personal life and see where we can maybe make adjustments. So again, because it's really important to me that we understand that this is not just elites and it's not just men and it's 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 not any specific type of person. It can be anyone that this can happen to. I would love to share with you a little bit about what my training week looked like before I got really sick. I use the word sick because that's how it feels. When you have overtraining syndrome, you do not feel like you're overtrained. You feel like you're dying. You feel like you have some kind of illness or sickness that someone hasn't yet diagnosed. And it's very complex because you never think that it's your training. It seems like your body's response is so outsized to what has become a sort of normal baseline for you, which is your training. Your training feels like, oh, well, that's normal. So this illness that I feel, this horrible feeling that I feel can't be coming from that because that's what I'm used to. That's really where it all starts. So I'm gonna tell you about my typical training week when I, uh, let's see, it was like the last year of my full-on training for ultramarathon. During this time, as I said, I moved out to the Bay Area. I was working in Silicon Valley. So I lived, uh, shared a house in Woodside. If you know that area, it's very hilly. Uh, I lived on the top of Kings Mountain, which is, um, it's, a, it's a mountain. So uh, anywhere you run, you have to you know run down the mountain and run back up to get home basically. So my typical week. So Monday I would take off completely. Tuesday I would do about an hour run. It was usually something pretty relaxed. I would never eat before that. I would probably have lunch and then probably not eat anything until that run. Wednesdays was uh, between 10 and 12. 12 mile run, it was usually 12. Again, I would do that after work, and again, I would do that not having eaten since lunchtime. Thursdays I would take off, Friday mornings I would get up at 4.15, pack all my stuff, head down to San Carlos where I worked, and do an out and back uh, seven miles on the Bay Trail for a total of 14 miles before like 8 a.m. Saturdays and Sundays I would either stay locally in Woodside, or I would head up to Mill Valley to run with, uh, like say, you know, the San Francisco Running Company or whoever was running up there. I would run between uh, 20 and 25 miles both days. Yes, back to back every weekend. So Saturday and Sunday, it was either, you know, 20, 22, 25 miles, same thing, you know, both days. And uh, I would always do that fasted. I would probably have one or two cups of coffee before heading out. So we're talking about somewhere between um, 15 and 20 hours of running per week. And um, like the total vertical was, I don't know, anywhere between like 2,000 and 8,000 per week, really depending on where I was running. Let's remember that no one is paying me to do this and I have a full-time job at the same time that I'm doing all of this. And I'm laughing, but it's not funny because you can see how this all came down. If we're talking about the concept of allostatic load, I have to add in all of the life stresses that were piling on top of this. I don't wanna to get too deep into my personal life because I don't want you to think it's just those factors because there's a million other ones, but I had a lot of stress going on with being away from my boyfriend. We were across the country for, from each other for that time. Um, I had a lot of work stress going on, was not happy in my job and had moved across the country to take it. I had a million and one things happening. So it was a really stressful moment in my life. I was feeling the stress of the running and the training and feeling like I just couldn't deal with it anymore. I had amenorrhea, hadn't gotten a period in almost you know four years at the time. So all of these things were weighing on me. And this is where we're going to talk about the different factors specific to ultramarathon training. Um, and you can also extrapolate this to endurance sport training um, that will potentially lead you to um, a situation where you're compromising your health enough to end up with overtraining syndrome. I'm going to go through a list of things that could be contributing to that allostatic load. Because remember, it's not just one thing. It's not your training and your nutrition. It's your training, your nutrition, and everything else. So let's start looking at this list. First thing we need to look at is your training. Do you live 
Or did you move to some place where everyone is training all of the time? Do you live, let's say, like in the Bay Area or Ashland or Bend or Flagstaff? I don't know, do you live in Chamonix? If you do, can I come visit? Do you live somewhere where there is a lot of vertical climbing? Are you always climbing no matter what? Do you use Strava or any other kind of GPS activity tracker? Is this app making you feel competitive with yourself or others? Is your race schedule filled? Are you one of those people that thinks it's cute to kind of humble brag how you can't do a taper week or a recovery week? By the way, this is me as well. Since I was doing a preview for the Castle Peak 100K in Tahoe through the Palisade section a week after doing Vermont 100K. Not smart. Do you fall prey to the concept of an active recovery day? This is epic BS, by the way. If you're having a recovery day and you need to put the word active in front of it, something's wrong. A rest day is a rest day. You should be resting. Have you ignored periodization for the most part in order to be sort of marathon ready all year long? Oh yeah, I did this one too. Do you have whoopsie mileage in your schedule? You know, it's that second run in the day because your friend called and it's a really beautiful night and let's just go do five miles. Is it the couple of extra miles that you tack onto a run because you're feeling really stressed that day? Or maybe you just really like the podcast you're listening to? Either way, those miles add up. Are you running fasted? Are you running on an empty stomach in the morning or have you not eaten in hours? How's that spike of stress hormone treating you? Are you not refueling between 30 and 60 minutes after a run? Are you not having a full meal with a good balance of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins within two hours of that run? Are you not hydrating adequately in the days after a long run or a race? Are you forgetting to take rest days entirely? That whole hashtag run streak thing, yeah, no. What else are you doing on your long run days? Are you going for the long run in the morning and then mowing the lawn and like tossing a football around with the kids and going shopping and doing 200 other things? If you are, you have to consider the fact that your 20 mile run now became a 30 mile run. Do you get adequate sleep? Do you drink too much coffee? You have to look at your life stuff also. It's not enough to say this is work or family or life stress. You have to really dig deep into all those aspects of your life in order to understand where all of this stress is coming from. Because all of this stress becomes part of your training. It's like wearing a weighted vest every time you go out to run. You're taking with you all of the baggage of your self-perception, everything about your life that's causing you stress. It's all coming out there on the road or the trail with you. And these factors will ebb and flow at different moments in your life. As I said before, it's useless to compare yourself to other people. It's also useless to compare yourself at this moment to yourself at any other moment in life. Even if your mileage is the same, even if you're wearing the same running shorts and you're wearing the same brand of shoes, all the rest of your life is different. You are different. You cannot compare your performance to anyone else's. Irrespective of what we might think, you don't know everything about someone just by looking at their Strava data. All of these things are contributing to the allostatic load, the overall sum total of stress in your life. I obviously cannot ignore the benefits of, for example, ultra marathon. Some of these things are clear stress reducers. The friendships that you make, the camaraderie, the volunteering, the whole community is amazing and so much fun. The best friends I have in my life now are people that I have met through ultra marathon. Let's not forget the stress relief of being outdoors, being in nature. That is something we cannot overlook. But if those positives are completely outweighed by the negatives of your training and lifestyle and nutrition and all those other factors contributing to that load of stress, they don't have a fighting chance. All right, on a personal level, the hardest thing for me to swallow about overtraining syndrome, um, yeah, the recovery has been difficult. It's a year later and I'm still, I'm still really not there. I don't know how long it's gonna take me to get back. By the way, don't go by me because I think my age factors into this. I don't think. <laughs> I know my age factors into this a little bit. I'm a little bit older than probably the average person that watches my channel. And I know that my limitations partly have to do with how many years I've been doing this. I don't think it's impossible to recover, so I'm not gonna say that. But one of the most difficult things for me to accept is the fact that there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. There are a lot of cultural factors uh, associated with this that I really, I don't wanna get into on this video, but we very much know that a sedentary lifestyle is bad. That's one end of the continuum, but the way I was living as an ultra runner was so far to the other side of the continuum um, that logically speaking, I have a hard time thinking that that was healthier. I'm pretty sure that health lies somewhere in the middle, and I guess it's just up to each individual one of us to figure out where that middle is. It's a difficult conundrum because, again, 
in our society, we are told that more is better and we should always push harder. With the sport of ultramarathon, like moderation is not our strong suit. We typically have high tolerances for pain and you know, we see miles, we wanna go run them. And it's very, very hard to understand that that instinct, which seems so pure and seems so healthy and seems like the best feeling on earth, really, could actually be doing me harm. Yes, not, uh, not an easy concept to understand or be comfortable with. So, you know, I'm gonna be dealing with this for a long time and taking you along for the ride. I hope that this discussion was helpful to you today. I hope that it invites you to look at the sum total of all the factors in your life that might be leading you to overtraining syndrome, or I'm sorry if you're already there like me. We're gonna get through this together. If you enjoyed this video, I would love it if you would give me a thumbs up and please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Share this video with anyone you think would benefit by watching it. I absolutely hope that you have an amazing weekend, but just please don't do back-to-back -back 20s. Don't do that. And I will see you again soon.